Hi, everyone. Today, I'm joined by Luke Thompson uh, in a bit of a crossover uh, conversation. Luke is a, a, a kind of active participant, uh, conversant member of the uh, the scene called, you know, the, this little corner of the Internet scene, um, which uh, has been getting has been recently engaging with metamodernism uh, and metamodern Christianity lately. And that has generated some interesting discussion and some, you know, sort of like theological back and forth and, and uh, this sort of a thing. And it's been, uh, it's been really interesting to, um, yeah, start to broaden the conversation, um, at least from my perspective, into these other, uh, you know, other parts of sort of the online community space and have some more overlap. And so I watched uh, Luke uh, kind of talk about his story with Christian Baxter. I did a podcast with Christian talking about my story and Christian's got a podcast called yours truly and he's very enmeshed in the uh, this little corner scene and so um anyway I saw that and Luke just seemed like a really bright well-read um you know uh Christian thinker um who has a really fascinating story but also has really yeah grappled with a lot of theological ideas and so I thought it'd be interesting to um you know further enmesh these communities and try to get some generative tensions explored and uh, dive into some of the theological content and the perspective possible Possibilities of a meta modern Christianity. So that's my setup for this combo. And uh, thank you so much, Luke, for coming on the podcast. Nice. Yeah. Thanks for having me. Uh, for I have a little bit of a cold. So forgive my constant throat clearing and coughing. Um. So first question I have is what? So you had this first conversation with Paul that was a little bit more. I don't know. People thought the tone was weird, and then you mm. had the second one, like the typical randos, that was good. Who else have you interacted with in the little corner or the comments besides Christian, I guess? Mm. And what's your vibe of it broadly? Yeah. My, well, the reason yeah. I ask yeah, is yeah. because it's, it's the, I don't know it from my understanding of it. And I'll speak with some people like Chad, who's a prominent guy in the little corner. Mm -hmm. I know a lot of these people offline, I mm -hmm. guess, or I've come to know them is it really is a, it's this weird kind of emergent, a uh, uh, very relational online community that I don't, I don't know of an equivalent really. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and I famously like, well, not famously, God, ridiculous. Um, I said once this guy, do you know who North Nathan Ormond is? This is all TLC insider lore. Uh, at this point, no, I'm still mostly a marginal interactant at this yeah, point. So yeah. I, I could tell you some of the folks I've interacted with, but, uh, yeah, I don't, uh, yeah, no. So he said once, I, I'm using it to illustrate things. This is yeah. how I, I'm like, a, I'm a weirdo. But um, to, to give context is he, he came in and interacted and was famously like kicked out of the Discord a few times. And uh, Joey, who started the Discord, didn't like him. And he's kind of come in and out. CW Weeks interviewed him for his first interview, actually. And he, I jumped on one of his live stream once. I'm trying to think of what his ch digital gnosis is his channel. He's okay. this... He has a decent following. He's a Brit and he's a young kid, like super whip smart. Um, and he kind of came into a fundamentalist evangelicalism, then left and he was kind of in the atheist movement. And now he's back on the fringes getting like, I don't know, some PhD in philosophy, really smart kid. But I jumped on his live stream and I said something like, it's deeper than ideas, man. And he just like, it's become this like little TLC meme where he has brought it up multiple times mm. and mocked about it. Because he's a very... And I say all that to say, like, the TLC really is. Like, we talk about ideas a lot, but it's it's really person-centric. And that's yeah. kind of on the backbone of the randos yeah. conversation. But anyhow. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, um, I... Uh, my framing of the... of, of this little corner, which yes, is abbreviated TLC. That took me a minute yeah. back, uh, you know, some weeks ago to kind of make that connection. But yeah, so the TLC, henceforth, um, I uh, became familiar of... Uh, about through um yeah these overlapping um kind of podcast and podcaster and sort of thinkers in this space so like um so john verveke is very a uh, much a part of sort of the meta modern conversation space and okay. john of course will talk to jordan peterson he'll talk to jonathan pajot he's talked to paul vander clay um greg enriquez has, has chatted with paul vander clay and uh in many ways a lot of the some aspects of the meta modern conversation space really uh, cohered in the wake of the Jordan Peterson phenomenon via channels like Rebel Wisdom, 
um, that were tracking a lot of that. And so there's been a kind of, um, yeah, adjacent relationship between some of the meta modern stuff happening and some of the figures in that conversation and uh, the Jordan Peterson Peugeot stuff. And then my understanding of TLC is that it's really paying attention to tracking and interpreting uh, sort of in real time the unfolding of a lot of the Jordan Peterson conversation, the Jonathan Peugeot conversation. Um, and, you know, and then as those figures have interacted with people like Verveke. And so um, when I was tr I was noticing all of that, uh, then Paul Anleitner po uh, posted some videos on metamodernism and Christianity. Right. And I thought, oh, that's interesting. Um, and of course, most people watching this now will know my whole history with Christianity uh, being brought up in that. And of course, my relationship with Christ uh, with metamodernism. So I was kind of keen to have that conversation at some point. Um, but then, you know, Paul and the Pauls actually have both had conversation, uh, conversations with John Verveke. And so at a certain point when Paul Vanderclay was getting into this topic of metamodernism and found some of my videos, that seemed like a, a ripe time for these communities to like be more directly engaging with one another. So then, yeah, then I finally went on Paul's channel or no, I'm sorry. I had Paul on the metamodern spirituality podcast. We talked. And as you say, yeah, I, I I didn't have enough context going into that conversation to fully like be able to maybe situate a, a, like where exactly that discourse was coming from. I was familiar with Peugeot and the symbolic world. So I thought a lot of it and with P Peterson and a lot of that framing has tended to um, lean into symbol and to sort of the literary and conceptual uh, and the psychological readings of the texts. And so there's a moment in my conversation with Paul where um, I kind of assumed that that was sort of the predominant frame when when we brought up the resurrection and the physical and the litter and all that. Then it was sort of like, oh, no, there's this whole uh, way in which there's a different theological angle here than maybe what I would see Peterson himself saying or uh, Peugeot. I still find a little bit to kind of, you know, be on the on the edges of all this. So anyway, just to, to finish that thought, then. We had these conversations, and I've I've been in contact with folks like Chad the Alcoholic and mm -hmm. uh, the and Grail Country, and they've reached out. So we're going to be having some conversations. Of course, I had a conversation with Christian Baxter, Baxter, mm -hmm. and uh, all that. So it's a pretty mm -hmm. superficial engagement so far. But the big takeaway that I'm seeing <clears throat> is that TLC, from my vantage, seems to have a, a more of a what I tend to think of as a conservative theological leaning to it. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and so I'm, I'm very happy to be disabused of that if that's a misconception, but like, um, yeah, uh, it, it seems like what I would, what I, how I would characterize it is that there's a lot of really rich intellectual engagement with those deep ideas you're saying, but it also does go much deeper than that. And it's very praxis oriented, but in terms of like dialing in on the theological stuff, um, I, I see a lot of discomfort with like historical critical readings and wanting to kind of dismiss a lot of that. I see a lot of discomfort with um, certain kinds of, yeah, maybe liberal theology or whatnot. And so that was part of why I want to talk to you because um, I, yeah, I'd like to get your sense of all these things and maybe we can hash out some of that stuff. But how does any of that land for you? Do you feel like I got anything really off there? Um, no, I mean, I think a lot of that's pretty accurate as far as I see it. Um. It's interesting because it's a uh, the the political conservative or conservative. I'm sorry, political. It was Freudian slip, or it was a tell. The conservative liberal paradigm. Mm -hmm. I mean, Paul talks about this a lot. Is kind of a I don't know. I I think it's a particularly um, Protestant frame, and uh, and by that I mean like post-enlightenment political national frame i'm trying to <clears throat> think of how to summarize and distill it down so even i i will agree with you some of those terms i, I think when we usually use those terms there's a political connotation yeah, sure. american christianity is really connected to all that obviously um and so when people say conservative what they typically mean is uh the way that i interpret that is they they lean into a very um Mm. Uh, I would almost say literal, historical, critical, not even critical, um, because that gets in the progressive yeah. thing, interpretation of the text, you know, six day creationism, mm -hmm. uh, physical res resurrection. I, but some of that stuff is so fascinating because I think TLC is pretty diverse. I mean, you'll definitely mm -hmm. discover talking, I'm guessing with Grail Country, you're going to talk to Nate. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I interact 
worked with a lot of Grail Country stuff. Those are some of my closest friends. Uh, and there are definitely people in there like Jedediah, who's often on Grail Country, is very self-admittedly on the liberal end of the spectrum politically. But all of those categories become very hard to pin down. Because one, mm -hmm. one of the things I, I, I love to quote, because I was speaking with my priest once, and he had this line I love to quote all the time. <clears throat> and he would he would say that, you know, you could look at that Orthodox church from the outside and you could say, well, it's very conservative in all the liturgy and the vestments and the structures and all that. But he said, then you have to always ask the question. This is always the thing with conservatism is what are we conserving? Mm -hmm. He said hospitality. Mm -hmm. And so that's kind of a there's a there's a Cohen in there yeah. and uh, a little bit because it's an it's an open you're conserving openness, hospitality uh means an openness to the outsider well well let's dig into this i'd love to try to unpack this a little bit and get some more clarity because i agree and that's been this has been a hard thing that i've been navigating with tlc is like these categories uh become really problematic and if you try to use them throw them around people will push back and say oh well, wait a second and then you're like oh okay well then not that but then yeah but then yep. the next thing out of their mouth will be something that you would associate with that category so you're like wait yep. i don't understand so like so um so but but at the same time i will totally acknowledge that like you know obviously to a certain degree, all words are imperfect and, and there's, they, they fail us in, in capturing the realities that we're trying to speak to, mm -hmm. but especially in this sort of domain of religion and, and with the nuance that I think people are, are really sensitive to in this corner of the internet that are trying to navigate that. So let's dig in. And, and, and if, if words like conservative or, or I tend to fall back on like terms like traditional devotional, um, mm -hmm. Uh, I do use the word literal, but it, again, these words have been around long enough that like the, I get these sort of triggered answers and I don't mean triggered like, a, oh, you triggered me, but I meant like you, you drop a word and then it's sort of like, oh, people already anticipated you using that word. So now they're going to yep. push back in a certain way. Yep. So you g give me some other words, give me some other language. How would you talk about some of the theology that's showing up in this space um, that, that, that might retain elements of the tradition and some of those interpretations and the the theology about that um but maybe isn't traditional isn't conservative do you, it, it, does that question make sense i can try to reframe it if not cuz it's a it's a hard I thing i mean i think i think so i can wing with it now to to validate what you're saying i mean and i run into this all, all the time i mean i don't i'm uh it's kind of hard to categorize because like I'm <laughs> Sherry and I, who's another Grail Country one, we often say this, or I've said to people before, like I'm more conservative than a lot of the conservatives that I know. And I'm more liberal than a lot of the liberals. I actually think that usually uh, I, I like to rely on a lot of uh, Jonathan Haidt's work in explaining this mm -hmm. or even um, David Bentley Hart speaks about these things well, but even in American, like the, the American political landscape I would posit that everybody's a conservative. They just have different values. Okay. They're trying to conserve different values. And conservative, mm -hmm. I like to understand in the Jonathan Haidt sense of the, it's uh, psychologically uh, illustrated most by the disgust impulse. You know, like the pe the persons that are outside, like the, you're almost scared of them. They disgust you. Or Peugeot mm -hmm. said, Peugeot used this once and illustrated very well, which would put me firmly in the liberal camp, as he said, kind of the, the, the boogeyman or the bad guy, the image for uh, a conservative is the chimera. You know, mm -hmm. it's just like, what is that? I can't, I can't put it into a category. So it weirds me out. Like, mm -hmm. what is it? It scares me. Mm -hmm. And the, the boogeyman of the uh, liberal type is the hillbilly, the inbred, mm -hmm. the thing that has no new life coming into it. Mm -hmm. And, and I think that's, that's my best I, I, I prefer that. And in that camp, I'm very much the hillbilly because that's the thing in my own traditions that I've been pushing back against, which I actually think has nothing to do with moral conservatism. It's like a, um, intellectually, I'm very liberal. Like I'm open to almost any idea I think you need to be because I think we have these, the, the broad way I would construct it is that I think in ancient times and like pre-axial times, uh, if you want to like, frame it that way people mainly tribalism manifested mainly around ethnic identity mm -hmm. and then and then we moved into peugeot and richard rollins spoke about this well with in like the let's see what would it be the 20th century no yeah 20th late 19th century we kind of we were we were slowly moving 
in the Enlightenment toward the, this nationalistic identity, which kind of manifested in fascism, communism, that kind of thing. And then people, the, the motherland, you know, we started thinking of things in terms of a mm -hmm. national identity. But now we have this weird, because of America and the Enlightenment, the evolution of all that. Well, America has a national identity, but it's not really national ethnic. Mm -hmm. It's it's completely ideological. Mm -hmm. It's outside of creed, race, ethnicity, like post-civil rights stuff. It's outside of all that. Mm -hmm. It's ideological. And I illustrate that. And I don't like to tell people who said this, but uh, I love this quote. It's the last remaining acceptable form of bigotry is against those with whom you disagree. Mm. And conservatives and liberals are both bigots in that sense. Well, yeah. And I would say that 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 progression that you just named um, is very it's an important one, actually, in in sort of metamodern framings of religion, because there is this sense of, as you say, like there's this initial ethnocentric perspective, um, which you can even go further back and see that basically is like um, the immediate family or tribal yeah, context. Yeah. Right. Sort of like. Yeah. So we move some from sort of like a tribal uh, a, a tribal centric perspective to an ethnocentric <laughs> perspective, like the whole yeah. group to uh, a, a um, kind of national nation centric perspective you could say or uh yep. kind of yeah that the nation state collective identity um and 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 that but but and well the last thing i'll say about that is that is in movement towards what you could view as a sort of cosmocentric or world centric perspective and if you take that seriously then there is this sort of expanding scope of identity shared commitment um and a sense of who my neighbor is. You could even say from a Christian perspective, right? You yeah. could almost identify that progression in the gospels where, you know, people say, you know, the good, the story of the good Samaritan is like, well, the Samaritan eth ethnocentrically speaking should be the other and it should be the, oh, they're not my neighbor. But then right. obviously that, that story uh, totally upends that to expand the horizon of sort of mutual connection. And so, yeah, kind of the point <laughs> and so, one. well, so, and, and so I think it's, it's, uh, it would be a a form of more world centric Christianity that I think the meta modern form would be gesturing towards, and so uh, the framings that I tend to find helpful are like to see that progression as a meaningful one and a helpful guide towards orienting ourselves. Um, what's interesting about that, though, is that in some ways that moves us into the secular, right? We almost have to enter that mode of awareness of other religions and other forms of Christianity. And then to be able to say, hey, wait a second, actually, you're not an other, you are still my neighbor, right? And and that I think is a, a real hard point for more traditional forms of Christianity to get behind because they're sort of like, well, yeah, but they're not really, you know what I mean? So do you have any thoughts yeah. on that, on, on what a metamodern, well, yeah, do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah. So um, what came to mind as you were talking, and I like this illustration. Uh, well, first off, you probably are familiar with spiral dynamics, right? Sure. Yeah. 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 I love spiral dynamics, um, integral theory, whatever. But when you were talking, it reminded me of um, trying to remember which book, but it's a C.S. Lewis book. I think it's in The Four Loves, actually, uh, where he talks about um, love of country and uh he makes this distinction essentially that like just because someone loves their country and their people group it's not necessarily at this exclusion of it's just an acknowledgement of who you are mm -hmm. and where you come from and your, your people group but but it's not necessarily set against someone who's not that in kind of this mm -hmm. zero sum way mm -hmm. and so part of part of what i like about I mean, secularity is complicated because, you know, this is all the work of Tom Holland. And and I would argue that to use a Joeian thing that I like is things or this is Jedediah Pascal, actually, from Grail Country combined with uh, Peugeot. But like things are relative, but they're not arbitrary. Mm -hmm. This is where like I don't like to throw out history, but like things are relative. That's totally true. Uh, and everything necessarily is. And part of that, just to sh put my cards on the table is because I would affirm a relational ontology like i just i'm i go fully there so mm -hmm. i think everything is necessarily relative because of the relations that we are made mm -hmm. of comprised of um and so to to bring all that back secularity is, is it's not arbitrary that it came out of the west and that it came out of protestantism 
And, and then it gave rise to this thing now that we call secularity. But like all these people are saying, whether it's Dawkins or Douglas Murray or Tom Holland or whatever, who call themselves Christian atheists because they have baggage and problems with the dogma, with the, you know, with, with particular aspects of the dogma, they still recognize that they are culturally and morally and Christian, largely, you know. Um, and that, I, I, this is what, I don't know if this is what metamodern Christianity is because I haven't engaged with the term a lot. But if it is simply a an acknowledgement that we can no longer uh, doctrinally silo ourselves in a zero sum competition against people that have other views and then just disregard them or other them or not engage with them based on their self identity to a different set of ideas, well, that I mean that's going away. I think that's just going to go away with the with the internet period because it's like this is Gutenberg 2.0. Like you yeah. can't maintain them. Well, I guess one question would be, what do you make of secularity and the contribution of, of secular modernity to the development of Christianity itself? And not just you, maybe what do you, what's your interpret, what's your interpretation of how folks in the, in the TLC, mm-hmm. in TLC generally uh, think about that as a, as a, as an issue? Um, I think it's a it's a mixed bag. Uh, I think most of the people in the T- TLC have gotten to the point. And it wasn't always this way. There's a little bit of more uh, uh, consensus thinking about the negative detriments of modernity, which mm-hmm. I, I mean I think is prim- primarily like different aspects of rationalism or ob- objective, like thinking. Paul calls the monarchical vision, mm-hmm. like thinking that postmodernism rightly critiques like this is where when Jordan Peterson talks about postmodernism, it drives me nuts Mm. because I think there are, I I say there's honest postmodernists and dishonest postmodernists, which I call mofo pomos. That's one of my little (laughs) Luke isms, but um, David Bentley Hart spoke about it really well in an article too, that I saw where he basically said that there are honest postmodernists, which just which just critique meta narrative. And that's correct. There isn't like some, transcendent propositional merit meta narrative that's essentially just the same thing as propositional tyranny because you're always interpreting all of that because that's the hard problem of all perception is that it requires a person to interpret anything mm. so that doesn't just apply to science that applies to narrative mm-hmm. as well it applies to everything but then there's the mofo postmodernists who say there is no meta narrative and that becomes the yeah. new meta narrative that they right. use to control and power and manipulate and yeah whatever screw those people or yeah. not screw those people, but screw those, screw that idea. Sure. That's a dumb idea. Yeah. And I guess I'll say this because I, I, I've thought of bringing this up in another context and I won't unpack it all here, but sometimes I get the feeling a little bit from the TLC that there's actually a very um, big openness to sort of postmodern thought uh, and traditional Some thought. Corners, and it, it's, sure. it's sort of like, but unfortunately, sometimes it I get the feeling that there's a kind of leaning on to postmodern critiques of modernity in order to make the idea land that everything's open to interpretation and that we live in sort of interpretive bubbles. And so why not the traditional interpretive bubble? It's sort of like a way of revalorizing traditional theological visions by bypassing modernity, by jumping to post-modernity. That would be a, a kind of critique, but do you, how, what would you, how would you reply or respond to that? Well, I think even trying to hold traditional values in that way, you're, you're some kind of a, I think the the term I like to use for that is you're some kind of a restorationist where you're where you're always looking backwards like we need to like the people that are trying to discover the true historical Jesus or the people that are just like trying to get back to the New Testament and biblicists that are just like this is when we had all figured out despite all the criticism St. Paul was having to all the different churches. Um, And and I think what Peugeot has illustrated really well is that there is no. There is no going back, and and that's a false understanding of tradition. Even um, one of my favorite intellectual voices in the corner, and I talk about him all the time, and I, I just think he's fantastic. Is Jordan Daniel Wood? He speaks about this stuff really, really well. Uh, David Bentley Hart speaks about it really, really well with tradition and apocalypse. But you can't like one way I'll illustrate it is this: is like Jordan Daniel Wood will talk. He talks a lot about Maximus the Confessor and the Council of Chalcedon in the early church. You know, where we're figuring out these divine and human attributes that natures of Christ and when what's going on there. This is the 
big schism between the church and the Oriental mm -hmm. Orthodox and um, where we get the Neo or the Chalcedonian creed. And, uh, and he likes to, he very adamantly says he's a Neo Chalcedonian. And, and by that, what he means is that he's not a restorationist Chalcedonian where it's just it's like this, this rational literal approach to the text that's always backwards looking, mm -hmm. which is really a rational approach to it, thinking that like we understood that fully in an encapsulated way. And he would say, it's always a yes and no. This is the spiral of understanding. And that's the Neo Chalcedonian aspect. He said, it's not that it's not that he believes what they said at Chalcedon was wrong. It's it, it, the misstep is when you think that you fully understood that in an encapsulable way that you can then control and you can do you can start playing the either or game which side of the line are you on here are you on the right side of the line which is of course my side you know my perspective my take on it that's the correct side what i call the exclusivist religion the right side of history mm. honestly i think that's what the game most people are playing in the west today in intellectual conversations they're trying to decide which side of the line you're on and then they're trying to decide if you're good or bad based on that in or out and i think that whole game is uh well, I don't know, in inhuman. Yeah, I I guess I, I'd love to drill down into this issue of secularity, oh. modernity, and history for a second, because again, Thanks. that's where I feel like there's the most um, discomfort in the TLC. By the way, do you say the TLC, or is it just in TLC? Because the T is this, so it's a demonstrative. Would you say the this corner of the internet, or just, that's I don't know true. if anyone... I don't know if it's a good well, question. No one has what, brought that up, but you whatever should just... the nomenclature is, I, it doesn't matter. Um, what which in is TLC, a meta point. point. The, yeah, the TLC. Well, anyway, so um, <clears throat> in the TLC, I feel like that's the element that is sort of most um, uh, maybe controversial, or or even beyond controversy in the sense that I feel like the the majority, the consensus view is, yeah, like the historical stuff is totally missing the point, and we can't even do it because look at all the postmodern insights about the um, you know situatedness of the observer, and and mm -hmm. to 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 unpack a little bit of that for a second, like all that's true, like the the postmodern insight is right that um, you know we sh we have to put the observer into the story we're not uh in a position to find what what paul calls the monarchical vision which is interesting because yeah. another context is called the god's eye view uh or the view <laughs> from nowhere right mm -hmm. is that everyone's situated and everyone is uh part of a sense making you know complex and uh and that it's actually an anachronism to try to uh sort of read back into the tradition the kind of modern historical hermeneutics as though that's right. the same thing. And I, I think all of that's more. right and should be owned. Right. What I, where I get uncomfortable though, is, um, but just to put my cards on the table is like, that doesn't mean that modern scientific and historical enterprises are therefore worthless. Right. Um, no. like, and, and that's part of where a lot of those, what you might call dishonest pomos or whatever, uh, tend to go with that is sort of like, Oh, okay, well then everything's just a social construct and we can't have any validity in anything we believe or whatever. Um, it's sort of like, no, that's not quite right either. Like we have, uh, we have more or less successful approaches to try to get close to what may have been or may be the case. And we should value those for what they are, but also not, over uh you know overstate what it is that they're actually doing and be blind to the way that they're not fully capturing the reality so i don't know for you the question would be um uh what is the role of historical methodologies in trying to apply those to the bible or to just a broader christian tradition what's the right role you know of historical analysis yeah like where does where do the tools of history properly fit into a, a a Christian life and a Christian in into the Christian materials? So uh, the way I'd probably respond to that would be, and this is not I'm not popular in TLC uh, <laughs> for this perspective, really. Um, I mean, kind of, but it irks people a lot. Like even recently, Paul just played a video. It's called his homeroom video where he clipped one of my live streams, big parts of it. And I mean, this is my own neuroticism, but I just focus on comments that are negative and people are like, I can't even listen to Luke. He just drives me so, makes me so angry. And it's because of these kinds of things. But um, mm -hmm. so Verveke, you're familiar with Verveke's five, four Ps. Yep. 
So propositional, knowing, perspectival, participatory, procedural. Mm -hmm. Um, I would say largely historical analysis is going to fall under the auspices of propositional. Mm -hmm. Uh, There's some procedural there. Um, and, and, And I'm of the opinion, probably the four P's, I actually think the four P's are uh, are part of a multiplicity whose unitive whole is, is the personal. And I, I just like mm. ram the personal all the time because I think the person is the center of reality. Is that period. a fifth P though? Or is that the participatory? I think it's, in the, the... Unity. I think it's the unity of the four. Oh, I see. P. Okay. Yeah. When they're integrated properly, yeah. it's the, it's the personal. And, and I would, the way that I've always understood propositional knowledge is that it is, um, it's uh, useful if used properly. So there's this line in the New Testament where St. Paul says, I think it's in First Timothy 1, I forget the verse, but it's something like, the law is just if used lawfully. Mm. And this gets into like the adverbial versus the adjectival like the law the law is great or saint paul says this many other places like in galatians you know he's saying uh the the law is a school teacher meant Mm -hmm. to to lead you into adulthood and i often say this like of my son and my kids you know i say when he's five and ten and whatever it's maybe like don't hit your sister but then if i'm having to tell him don't hit your sister if the methodology is still the law when he's 20 i failed Mm -hmm. as a parent right so like the laws and i think that's saint paul's point is like the law is fine but like it's it's meant to actually lead to wisdom and to mm-hmm. something that actually transcends the law. We all know these kinds of things intuitively. Like martial arts, people often say this. You have to learn or the scales in the piano. You yeah. have to learn the rules yep. so that then you can break the rules, which yep. is like what poetry does with language mm-hmm. or whatever. Mm-hmm. Uh, the same thing is true in the propositional because the propositional logic works in a binary. But reality is more like the Tao than a, than a straight Sure. On, off binary. And so I think propositional, all that to say, propositional knowledge, I think is, and this is where I like, I just, Michael Polanyi, I think is the best at talking about propositional knowledge. Um, I've, I've honestly not read a lot of his books. I've just discovered like little tidbits here and there. And um, the way that he talks about it is really great, really coheres with most of what we know from cognitive science now and building neural networks that like Verveke and Peterson talk about all the time. But propositional knowledge, this is this is the cliff notes that I would say, is that it is its potential. Hmm. I think that's all propositional knowledge is potential. But with I'm very firmly with Rilke, who I think is also what Christianity is about, is the point is to live everything. And mm-hmm. so if propositional, if propositional knowledge manifests in your life in an embodiment of what you're supposed to be arguably the fruit of the spirit, you know, love, all that stuff. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Yeah. But that very often propositional knowledge is the easiest to fuck with too. People think they believe things and they don't, which is why we see therapists, which is why the alcoholic drinks. Of course he knows it's wrong, bad for him, but we do it anyhow. This is what psychology is about in the shadow. Well, so question though. So you cited St. Paul. Um, Why? So, um, I would say, because that's just a huge part of my consciousness Congress to quote, uh, PVK, it's a big, Oh no, I'm sorry. I meant, uh, I meant St. Paul, not, not, yeah, yeah, not... Yeah. no, I know. Oh, okay. When you said PVK, I was like, Oh no, not that Paul, the a... other Paul. <laughs> PVK has this term consciousness Congress, oh, meaning okay, like the voices inside your head. Yeah. 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 Um, St. Paul is a huge part of that. And a lot of that is because of all the diff- all the different relational aspects that make up who I am. I was mm-hmm. raised in a Christian family to Christian parents. I grew up in a very biblicist tradition. I've read a lot of St. Paul. I've read a lot of the New Testament. These are the conversations I have mm-hmm. all the time. You know, I go to a, a church now that, you know, acknowledges him as a significant part yeah. of the authority of the tradition of the church, all those reasons. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Great. That's helpful. So then with that, <clears throat> um, where I kind of, and I'm not sure if you watched, I, I did a video called metamodern Christianity. I think it was simply called, and it was, uh, I spent a lot of time talking about how I kind of 
crack the history nut here. And it would go mm -hmm. something like this, right? Like you quoted St. Paul for all the reasons you just said. Now, the consensus among modern historical critical uh, studies is that Paul didn't write First Timothy. So the passage mm -hmm. that you cited would, from a historical vantage, not go back to Paul. Now, yeah. now, if someone wants to make of that, oh, no, now I can't cite that or now it's not authoritative or whatever, I would say they're missing the point because yeah. all of the reasons why you cited St. Paul have nothing to do with what, who historically wrote it. It had all to do yeah. with your history. Um, <laughs> so but where I land with all that is that history can tell us things that then we can integrate. But uh, it is precisely that kind of what do we do with it? It's the wisdom that comes from that. It, and it, it would be perverse and probably unwise to just throw out a bunch of our tradition and our what we value, what we're familiar with and all that, just because some historian says something, right, right. at a propositional level. Um, and so I'm inclined to go in the direction of, okay, so let's learn the history, uh, but we also come up from traditions, and then let's allow those things to be in tension and maybe even total contradiction sometimes with each other. But also then just allow those two frames to be what they are and move beyond them. How does that sit with you? Um, yeah, I mean, I like a lot of that. I guess the it's it's just interesting. I don't know how much of this comes down to temperament or or what exactly it is, because like even because I'm pretty sure in the church and I'm, I'm, you know, by no means I'm no expert of like orthodoxy or something. I converted two years ago. I've been, you know, I was inquiring for longer than that. I'm not an expert. I don't even really read about that stuff that much, as much as I used to as a Protestant. But um, I think they say also he's the author of Hebrews, and like nobody has thought historically right. that Paul was of Hebrews for a long time. Yeah. Uh, my 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 knee jerk response to that, and this isn't to trivialize it, is just like I don't care. Yeah. So then, so then let's 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 dig into that. So. I think that that's the response I hear a lot. And I'm like, good, you shouldn't really ultimately care. But then the reasons why people don't care, I feel like aren't miss, aren't catching something because a lot of people mm -hmm. will say, yeah, I don't care. I'm just going to I'm just going to still believe that he did. And it's like, well, wait a second. That's not quite right. Right. Like history is a thing. Like like, for example, you know, like if, if <laughs> uh, you know, you were talking about the 19th century and nationalism. Right. Um, yeah. That's that's based on historical methodologies that we know about those things. And so then if I don't know, this probably wouldn't happen, obviously, at these at this point and given all the evidence that we have for 19th century history. But let's say someone's like, actually, nationalism wasn't really a thing in the in the 19th century. Right. Like most times we hear historical information, then we say, oh, OK, I guess I have to update my understanding of history in light of that. Uh, but then it seems to be a special case when it refers to religious stuff where it's like, oh, okay, yeah, but I don't care. And so I want to, I want to help people get to the, I don't care part. I just feel like that needs to be done with intellectual integrity to say why you don't care. And for me, it's because what you really care about is the participatory and the perspectival and those deeper ways of knowing and the tradition and your history that you were brought up in that you can you can cognize the history such as the modern mm -hmm. historical stuff gives it to us, but you can also say, um, yeah, okay, that's fine. But that really doesn't have to do much with all that other stuff. You know what I mean? So like, anyway, that that's my take on the, I don't care, but what's your take on the, I don't care. Um, I suppose I would just kind of go back to what I was saying with Rilke. Like I, at the end of the day, what matters to me is, uh, that people, as a Christian, I think the deepest part of that is that you want predominantly yourself, but also others to manifest Christ to the world. Mm. And so to actually be that. Mm -hmm. And so I'm kind of like St. Paul, first Corinthians nine, you know, or first Corinthians nine, whoever the author is, you know, I become all things, uh, to all people that for the sake of Christ, I may win some, it's just yeah. like, it doesn't, um, and, and it's not even, um, the, the history I suppose is like, it's like interesting to me, but also like, I just don't, I don't put a lot of stock in analysis. One of the things I like to talk about is the Chinese farmer. And there's also a really great article that, or part of an essay or something that Lewis wrote on vivisection where he says like modern science, you know, tries to understand life by like, vi like dissecting a frog. Mm -hmm. Well, it's dead. You're right. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and so and, and I think we often do that 
the same kind of analysis with yeah. history and with, you know, you're killing the thing through right. your analysis. And, and often those things will change and they're evolved through history. So like, I'm slightly interested in them, but also because of the, the way that I just put very little emphasis on propositional knowing as I think, I think it is the least powerful probably of the four P's to actually make you into a good person. Well, let me ask you this. If, um, if you found out, let's say you grew up in a Christian church and you had all the background that you did. And then let's say you became, I don't know, you got, you turned 20 years old and you went off to school and someone said, um, the Bible, well, that was written 45 years ago by a guy named Thomas Barry, uh, Wisenacre. And, uh, everyone knows that, you know, let me show you and let me prove it to you. And, and then like, let's say you were just, that was demonstrated to you. Would that change your faith? Hmm. Well, what comes to mind is like, I don't know. I don't know how he would demonstrate yeah. that. Cause again, he would be demonstrating that probably propositionally. And I would have to ign ignore like my existential and phenomenological experience of like the rest of entirety. Right. Of the world, which I think has been, thoroughly christianized like that's kind of the whole point is like i think most of the modern world <clears throat> through technology really and so i mean and there's a good and bad aspects of that has been christianized through the technology of the west sure. i mean like you you talk to almost anyone of like what it means to be a good person they're going to be consciously or unconsciously just talking about uh self-sacrifice loving your enemies, you know, you the know. golden rule, that kind of stuff. And so I would be like, well, yeah, you can disprove the Bible. What do I do with all of that stuff? Well, let me ask you this. You mentioned, you said earlier, right? I, you mentioned first Corinthians, which for the record is considered historically to be one of the authentic Pauline epistles. Oh, thank God. <laughs> but, um, but, but you also said, or whoever wrote it. Right. And I wanted to latch onto that. It's like, yes, or whoever wrote it. Like, does it matter if it was or not, right? Like, why do we why do we care so much about authoritative uh, notions if they're not tied to some traditional theology of inspiration or something, right? Because what I would be inclined to say is that if it's true, it's true. And it doesn't matter if Paul wrote it or someone else. It doesn't matter if Walt Whitman said it, that if it's speaking to a truth, then it's true. And... And then that leads me into this sense of like, well, a lot of the things you also just described about self-sacrifice and the golden rule, these are spoken uh, across culturally outside of Christianity yeah. as well. Right. And so that all, I take those things and I interpret them in light of what we were talking about earlier is moving from ethnocentric to, you know, nation centric to world centric is like from the world centric perspective, you're like, oh yeah, this, the, the truths have been spoken uh, by a bunch of different people throughout mm -hmm. time here and there. And, you know, <clears throat> Christianity has a lot of those, but so does Buddhism. So does, you know, um, right. Judaism, et cetera. Um, and, and that to me seems like that progression that seems true itself as well. Um, and so it, that seems to gesture in a sense through Christianity and beyond it in terms of its specific historical instantiation that like the Christ would be that universal truth that is being accurately identified across these different traditions and seen and named and described. And, uh, and that that's the, the reality that the reality of Christ can actually exist outside of, of Christianity, even if viewed from that lens, what do you make of that conglomeration of thoughts? Well, yeah, I'm, so I'm a weird Christian in that I am a, I don't know. This, this is going to be very non-dual. And so I, I think Christianity is a kind of exclusivist inclusion. Um, and so in the same way that you're talking about like universal cosmic Christ stuff, I affirm all that. And I think all truth is God's truth. And, you know, C.S. Lewis talks about the Tao and the truth that's in every religion. And, and I affirm all, a lot of that. I think that's very true. Um, I suppose the way that I would talk about it is, um, Still, so I, a huge part of the reason I'm a Christian is because of all the reasons I listed before. I grew up Christian, all of that. Uh, you know, what you see in here depends a lot on where you're standing and the kind of person you are. Like, mm -hmm. that's one of, I love that phrase. I think that's very true. 
Um, however, I, I still very much, uh, believe that, uh, the thing, the dogma largely of Christianity is true. And, and the, and the, and so like Christ, there is this Christ universal Christ, but Christ is also, he is the universal particular. And so that universal simultaneously, I think needs a particular instantiation. Yeah which I think is a historic Jesus Christ. And it's not, yeah. and it's not just Jesus Christ in and of himself in the way that I think a lot of conservative fundamentalist Christians, just like dispensationalists, just keep pointing back to the historical Jesus in this rest, pure rest, restorationist way. And then they're just waiting for the world to burn and Jesus to come back and save us from mm -hmm. everything. I think that fractally is meant to radiate out to every person in every time which is why I'm a Christian universalist. I think that's the whole mystery of Christ, which is Christ in me in Colossians one. Well, let me ask you this. So you, you, you affirm this sort of like universal Christ consciousness yeah. element or some yeah. elements of it, but then you do uh, acknowledge, as you say, or you, you specify that that, that needs a imminent historicized particularized form. And, and that's where the, the dogmatic aspects of Christian Christianity come in. Yes. However, I would never impose that on someone else. Yeah, sure. Sure. Because that's, I mean, yeah, but just to get a sense of how, it or you don't. yeah. And just to get a sense of how you think about this though, because so then, then that does seem to get us back to the issue of, chronological time and history of like, yes, there's all that, but there was this human being named Jesus of Nazareth and he did right. such and such and such. And this is recounted in the gospels. Right. So if that's yeah. all true, which again, I would say like, that's a, that's a, a very kind of common classic theological, you know, if you want to call it traditional devotional, it's, it's, it's a, it's a very familiar traditional uh, theological lens. Mm -hmm. How does that not get us entangled with the thorny issue of history and hist historiography again, if we're talking about things happening in space time, like why, why shouldn't that be amenable to the same kinds of historiography that we use to talk about Abraham Lincoln? Well, you can, I mean, you can, like I was saying, you can do all that. I just don't put that much stock in that kind of propositional analysis. I don't think that's the primary way that we know things. And um, the, one of the ways that I would illustrate that is, um, a, a well-known English-speaking Orthodox intellectual is this guy, Father John Bayer, and he has a, um, a lot of his lectures and sermons online are basically just illustrating this one point. I mean, he speaks about a lot of things. He's done a lot of research with Origin recently, just had a new big translation. But um, he says that, like, what's – he asked the question in a very, like, dialectical way of his students very often he would say is like what's one of the most shocking things about the new testament when you read it and he doesn't like just feed you the answer so then everybody's you know pull parroting this like mm -hmm. sunday school answer that they think he's looking for and it's not usually it and he says well one of the most shocking things is just like how how much like for how much the disciples and the apostles just didn't believe anything that jesus was saying repeatedly over and over and over and then, you know, at the end of his life, at the in the Passion, Peter betrays him three times. Judas betrays him, hands him over to the authorities. Everyone leaves him except arguably John. <clears throat> and But he's standing a, a ways off. Mm -hmm. And then even after the crucifixion, they're all just like torn up. And they're just like, he doesn't, like it's over, you know. And then there's even, this is the whole f literal physical resurrection thing. Mm -hmm. And Peugeot's spoken about this well. I mean, I don't know if these people are reading the New Testament because it seems pretty amorphous and nebulous, you know, because he shows up in the garden. They think mm -hmm. he's a gardener. They don't recognize him The on the road to Emmaus. You know, they don't recognize him. He shows up in the upper room. They don't recognize him. He's in the room where all the disciples are hiding. Jesus, mm -hmm. the resurrected Jesus, that everyone's like, you should believe in. At the time in the text, they don't recognize him. That's what the text says. Mm -hmm. And then it says, Bear, this is Bear's point. He says, and then it says, he, the text, this is what it says, he opened the scripture, showing them everything concerning himself, and they broke bread, and their eyes were opened, and they saw him for who he was, and then he disappeared. And so Father Bear's point is like, it's not as if you had a time machine and you went back, you'd all of a sudden recognize the historical Jesus and his resurrection and acknowledge it. Because even in the text, that didn't happen. 
you recognize and understand Jesus now the exact same way that the disciples did. It's the exact same thing. And, and Father Bear would say through the opening of the scriptures and the breaking of the bread, which is the, yeah. through the sacraments. That's what the sacraments are. Now, at the same time, though, we have to give credence to scripture, sacraments, and those things to be the 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 lens that we uh, find to be authoritative and let's say epistemology shaping for us for that to happen, right? Uh, in the sense that, like, um, you know, it's and that all those things on their face might seem a bit um, not immediately obvious to be the epistemologically shaping things, right? If I were to go to a uh, I don't know, part of China or something and be like, hey, the only, the way that you will experience truth is if you eat this and read these yeah. books and then they'd be like, wait, why? Like, who are you? <laughs> you know, um, and similarly, right? Like if like aliens came yeah. down or let's just say, I don't know, some other group of people came yeah. over and they're like, hey, the thing that you need to do is jump up three times and twirl around and whatever, right? Th these things seem arbitrary to some degree. Yeah. Now, this, I think, gets us back to that hang up or that issue that the postmodernists were bringing up is that actually like, yeah, huh, we do tend to see things as true through the lens that we are enculturated into and mm -hmm. that those are necessary preconditions for us having certain <clears throat> experiences of reality. And I'll grant you all that. But then the question seems to become why this framing, why this lens, right? And it it then seems like that is something that only kind of manifests if you are brought into that particular lens and give it credence in that authority, but other people won't and other people don't. And maybe there's something about that lens that is even um, limiting too, right? Because to see one reality is also to not see others. Um, and so that, again, also brings me back to, you know, uh, trying to expand those frames and those scopes from the ethnocentric and the nation centric to the world centric, trying to expand those scopes from the religion centric to the, you know, broader uh, perspective that that might be. And so there is a certain hang up at certain points, maybe inevitably in all these conversations where someone will say, look, man, you just won't get it unless you do X, Y, and Z, unless you take the sacraments yeah. and you're going to church and you're doing all this, you're not going to have that experience. And it's like, yeah, but also I could go become a Confucianist or, uh, you know, or a Muslim and mm -hmm. I could do, you know, I could do Salat mm -hmm. every, every day, five times, et cetera. Right. So I don't know if you have any, uh, thoughts on that issue. Um, yeah, I mean, I would affirm, Pretty much everything you said i think the only um the one thing is i would say is like i think we all see the same reality it i think we uh i think we suppress the truth and righteousness again i'm sorry i'm quoting a lot of scripture i'm hyper conservative biblicist uh but and i think that's what we everyone i think suppresses what they rightfully know which is another reason why we need to become like small children because i think small children get this stuff uh, largely. Um, and we, and we confuse ourselves with all these narratives and meta narratives, the older that we get, because we're not participating in our imagination properly. But, um, I, I don't, the main thing that came up when you were talking is I was thinking of, uh, God and mammon, you know, you cannot serve two masters. You'll love the one mm -hmm. or hate the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. You can't transactionalize any of this stuff. So like when I say the opening of the scriptures and the breaking of the bread, you think you can't turn that into an idol and try to make that into mammon where you're going to get a desired result? Well, then you've just made Christ into Antichrist. And God doesn't play games, I don't think, that way. Um, and so I'm not, when I say that, I think this is where I'm confusing to people is because they're like, you're simultaneously saying two things. And I'm like, yeah, I am, because that's <laughs> how I think reality works. Well, that might be um, some of the source of some of the equivocation that I, I struggle with in the in the TLC is like, well, wait a second, you just said the opposite thing. But anyway, sorry, Well, I, I don't to, to affirm a lot of what you're saying is not so much um, is is not so much that. I mean, I'm I'm a weirdo in the TLC, too, I would say. I, I don't know that I speak. I'm a prominent figure in that, maybe, but I don't speak for a lot of people. There's a lot of people who just be like, absolutely. Luke does not speak for me. Sure. Yeah, of course. Um, because there's a lot of people who, um, I think, and tell me if I'm completely wrong, a lot of the thing that you, I think one of the things that you are most concerned with, and I don't want to just like, this is just something that I'm seeing, sure. and you completely disregard it. You have a, a palpable 
concern and fear because of your own experience in the church that people are going to, and I have the same thing. I have the exact same thing that people are going to, this is my big experience with the church and what I hate about it uh, or the air quote church. And what they do is they, they want to transactionalize all these things. They want to take God down and control him and take these, these things that should be icons and turn them into Mm. idols. Mm. And I am adamantly opposed to all those things. And people hear me saying this of orthodoxy all the time. Like I will affirm the sacrament, the proper, you know, people talk about like apostolic succession, binding and loosing authority of the apostles, which is then given to the bishops. So that's the proper opening of the scriptures. It's not just like this arbitrary, you just go read the scriptures and it's some like Mm. magic thing where all of a sudden you're going to see. I don't think that's the way that it works. There's proper... A sacrament has to be properly done by, through the right people. Yeah. And even then, that doesn't mean that can't be bastardized. Of course it can. And it has been many times. Mm. Um, every, everything has to be in alignment to, the, to Christ mm-hmm. for it to work the way that it's supposed to work. And I think that even happens. I mean, I'm guessing you'll talk about this with Nate, but Nate and I have said this a lot. Nate said this, I think, before... Verveki ever said it. It's become a thing now. Like Christianity already is the religion that's not a religion. Hmm. I mean, I think it always has been. I think it's been bastardized and been made into institutional religions where you where people try to control and manipulate things, which you see in like the Reformation and aspects of constant Constantinianism, you know, yeah. and its ties to the politics and all that stuff. Yeah. But I think that's all a bastardization. Well, let me ask you this. Um, to get back to this issue of like framing and, you know, what, what shapes what we see and all of that, um, Mm -hmm. one could make the case and I'll, again, cards on the table. I I affirm this uh, view, but I'm open to critiques of it. One can make the case that what modern science at its best allows is for people to actually have a set of tools and ways of approaching knowledge that people can come from radically different backgrounds, but actually come to affirm the same element of, of reality that, that they're seeing. Uh, so like, for example, right, like you could grow up in a, in a very Christian household and you could grow up in a very Muslim household, or you could grow up in, you know, like any name, any kind of like totally world shaping perspective. Right. But we could also see people from all of those backgrounds kind of move and grow through them And then all grow up to become scientists and then all look at certain elements of reality and share a a, a coherent vision in the same way because they're using certain principles and certain sort of shared um, epistemological uh, tools. And to me, that doesn't mean that I'm I'm not saying that the scientific framing is the totality and that that's the be all end all. But it does seem to gesture towards this notion that if that is where thought can gain coherence, that there's sort of a public consensus making discourse space that it seems to exist beyond parochial traditional world shaping that we do experience in the secular modern sphere. And it's the basis for modern democratic nation states and our medicine and a lot of the technology and all the stuff that's sort of driven, you know, the advance of modernity for better or worse, right? But it still has a profound causal impact on the world and has a lot of uh, causal power. Um, And so, my interpretation of that is to be inclined to see uh, that it is possible for people to come into alignment with their perspective of reality, despite having their worldview kind of, you know, necessarily shaped, but uh, by these different kinds of perspectives, mm-hmm. it's just there you're operating from the perspective of, well, here's um, a set of sense making and uh, interpretive tools and sets of kind of validation techniques that we can use so that despite your background, if you kind of adhere to this basic set of logic and methodologies, we can actually all be seeing the same thing. And so I see that then therefore as sort of a more encompassing, more integrative perspective than the radically different worlds that people will grow up in, in a parochial sense. Would you disagree with that? It, what's wrong with that way of looking at things? Um. Well, so you're talking... You're talking about science, the scientific approach to um, 
Well, I would say reality in general, but I could be more specific, right? Like you could, uh, like, like, uh, what's his name? Uh, Reza Aslan, I think. Uh, he was is an Iranian. He comes from uh, actually an atheist and kind of uh, partially Muslim background, I think. Yeah. But he can do modern historical critical study of of the Bible and come to the same kinds of conclusions that a Christian. Uh, someone raised in a Christian background can come to, and a Muslim, and a Hindu, and a and a Marxist, or whoever you know, uh, whatever background you you come from, if you go into studying the historical modern critical method and apply that to the scriptures, those people can have a conversation where they're, where they're all kind of talking about the same thing based on the same means, whereas all those other earlier. Uh, parochial perspectives will all kind of disagree about fundamental reality. And so I want to suggest that maybe there's something to that, that what happens at this space that is somehow allows us to transcend some of those limitations of what shapes our epistemology. Or maybe that's well, just modernist propaganda or something, you know, I don't well, know. I mean, I don't know. I mean, I, I would say that I probably don't know enough about historical criticism practically to even i mean i know what it is generically but i don't mm -hmm. i haven't studied it yeah and and i'm not trained in that sort of thing so i don't even know that i could speak to what it really is i i would say that i'm probably i'm probably doubtful about it especially as it moves further and further from the hard sciences um when even like you get to something like medicine is really an applied science mm -hmm. um like medical diagnosis and you know during like we've even seen the last few years and despite all our medical inter interventionism like our broad health is just plummeting like in america for example mm. um and so it's almost like the more we know and the more we the more people adhere to the the standard protocols of medicine the less healthy we're getting mm. so um so I'm dubious of that kind of stuff, especially when it gets to like applied sciences. But then the other thought that I had is even what what it seems like to me is even if there is some, even though I can't articulate what it is, some practical approach you to historical criticism, really what that is, is just like a procedure mm. that people participate in mm -hmm. that creates perspectival salience because mm. that's what mm -hmm. we are looking at. Yep. You know, you're getting relevance realization because of these procedures and, and participation in it, mm -hmm. which lends to perspectives. And then you extrapolate that to propositions. I mean, yeah. it's like, yeah. I don't know why that's any different than, but that's the same thing you're doing when you go to a liturgy. I mean, well, it's that, just yeah, but, but that's an interesting point, right? Thing. Though, is that only, um, how would you say, this is a really interesting topic to dig into because uh, this is this is like a profound philosophical issue, right? So like, what is the difference between the procedural aspects that go into the knowing of science versus those in the liturgy? Um, and, and, you know, the kind of more radical postmodern view would be to say none. In that sense, science is no different from religion. Um, but I'm not inclined to go there. I'm, I'm inclined to say, well, what has a greater causal power uh, by a kind of pragmatic um, uh, appreciation for the output of certain kinds of ways of knowing, right? Like, and 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 so, right? Like, uh, magic is also procedural, and and then leads to propositions, right? And like, you could mm -hmm. use voodoo, or you could use, you know, some kind of like rain dance to try to propitiate a god or something, right? But then you could come along and try to see, well, what's the uh, what's the success rate of that? And then you could compare that to other methods and say, oh, well, actually, maybe this has, you know, there's no uh, difference between, uh, you know, this method versus chance for yielding a particular outcome. And then this is the beginning of scientific thought itself that's able to adjudicate those things, locate the causal variables, and then act upon them. And then arguably, you, you, you are able to do things more efficaciously. So that would be the epistemology justification for certain modes of, yeah, procedural knowing over others. Um, and I think that if we're going to avoid the real radical relativism that 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 uh, forms of postmodern thought pr present us with, um, we have to take that seriously. The last thing I'll say about that, though, is that mm -hmm. I think where m modernity fails is it only looks at utility and efficiency and things like that, and it misses wisdom, right? And it misses the whole other aspect of us being, as you say, you know, from a relational ontology, operating together and having to do meaningful things with each other that are rooted in value. And like there, it just doesn't know what to do. 
um, because you actually have to expand further from the modern perspective to see all of that stuff going on. Um, and so I would say that, uh, that that then updates our procedural knowing to be able to say, oh, actually, we need to be aware of all this other stuff. And that is the legitimate insights of, of postmodern thought to be able to bring in the context and, you know, oh, you're making us aware that we're, we're using a lens and how does that maybe impact the conclusions we're coming to and all that. But like, I see these are, as updates. And so then there's a, a broad trend and it goes back to the same kind of trend of the ethnocentric to the nation centric to the world centric is that there's a, a way of seeing the unfolding of history itself as leading towards these kind of upgraded perspectives not in a naive way and not in the sort of, you know, idealistic, oh, isn't everything getting better for, you know, all the reasons we can critique modernity and things like modern science. Uh, but at the same time, I broke my hand. And if that had happened 500 years ago, uh, I would uh, I'd, I would have a bum hand <laughs> for the rest of my life. So we got to give modernity its due. Yeah. Um, so those are, just, those are just some thoughts. Um, uh, I have another question that kind of relates to all this, but I'm not sure if you want to say anything else to any of that or take anything in a different direction. Um. No, I mean, I have a few more thoughts, but it would just, we just, I don't know that it would be yeah helpful. It would just bog us down. Okay. So then like, so here's a very specific one where you brought up the hard sciences, right? Like I would say archaeology is a pretty good hard science. Uh, well, something like it, right? Yeah, like we have certain yeah. kinds of, yeah. Uh, but it's certainly, you know, there's stuff, there's evidence we can draw conclusions from it and that sort of a thing. It's, it's different from like text, textual criticism and stuff like that. It's, uh, you know very evidentiary based. Um, and this fo folds into scientific modern historical critical methods because we can use archaeology to like look at the Bible or like, no, I shouldn't say the Bible. We should we can look at the areas in which the Bible occurred and then see what kind of historical or um, rather archaeological uh, artifacts exist that can be dug up and examined that might, you know, relate to those events, right? Um, yeah. So as biblical archaeologists in the 20th century have done that more and more, and William Deaver is great and Israel Finkelstein, people like that. Um, one of the insights from a lot of that is that uh, a lot of the early biblical material doesn't track with the archaeological record. Like there doesn't mm. seem to be any archaeological evidence for a conquest of Canaan or an exodus or anything like that, or that the grand um, you know, period of, of, of Solomon's reign was this grand. It, it seems to have been a rather tiny nation. And, you know, and then only you get sort of the growth of anyway, blah, 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 blah. So basic insight is that like mm, archaeology brought to bear on biblical uh, events doesn't really corroborate that so much. Um, presuming that's true, do you say, I don't care? Or, and if so, why? Or do you say, what do you say? Like, do you say, well, that's bad archaeology. And if they did it right, it would corroborate it. Or is there some kind of way of being like, yeah, but that it doesn't matter if there wasn't an exodus. It doesn't matter if there wasn't a conquest or does it like these are the sorts of things I'm kind of interested in getting your perspective on. Um, Yeah, that's a good question. I don't. I think where I would probably be most where I would probably go with that just automatically would be again, like we'll, you know, we'll see and time, you know, time is the revelator kind of, and, and that kind of varies and changes all the time. But yeah, to grant the point is like a thought experiment. Um, let's just say it's as ironclad as evidence can be that like, it just, those things didn't happen. Um, I mean, I, I suppose that would be that would be troubling. I mean, that would cast doubt on. I mean, it would cast doubt at least on those narratives mm -hmm. of how things came to be. I mean, it's it's a it's an interesting thing because I I don't know what I would really do with that um, personally. I've kind of always in a sense, religiously, I've always been pretty, um, there was a time I was into apologetics and things, and that was more of my probably evangelistic days, evangelical days. Um, but even now, like I'm just, I'm really just pretty concerned with practical things of, of uh, yeah. I mean, and I like to talk about this stuff online with people, but being a good father, being a good husband, uh, this kind of stuff that is very tied to ideas of the New Testament and Christ. And I mean, and you see aspects of it in Judaism, obviously, as well, and other religions, but repentance, transformation, um, a lot of 
even psychology came out of, as far as I know, Ignatian spirituality and monasticism. And so um, that's the kind of stuff that I'm most concerned with because I don't, I've often said to people and it's, and it is a little bit troubling to me because I have a science background and I know these things is like, there, there's this one of the dogmas of science is like, if, if something is unfalsifiable, mm. then it's a problem. Right. And, and I kind of feel that way in spite of my personal story and deconstruction around some of the ideas of Christianity. And I still feel this way. I just, I don't even know the kind of people that go through atheist phases or even agnostic phases. I have an ongoing conversation with a person. I just, I can't, I don't understand it. I don't even know hmm. how I could get there. Oh, interesting. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Cause I have to admit, I didn't watch the entirety of your conversation with uh, Christian. So I wasn't sure if that ever came up for you. And that was kind of a question I, I was curious to ask too, is like, if you'd ever gone through a certain kind of deconstruction where you'd grappled with nihilism or atheism or meaninglessness or that sort of thing. And yeah. No, never. I mean, I, I questioned a lot of the doctrines. I mean, the broad, mm. the, the short version is the doctrine of hell. Like I had a complete liminal moment where mm. I basically found out, you know, this certain understanding of hell that I would, to me, I thought was just ironclad, but I basically found out I knew nothing about it. Mm. And it was just a completely indoctrinated thing in the wrong sense of the word. Mm. And, uh, and, and the more that I discovered about it and, uh, the history of it, the history of how that doctrine has evolved and changed, especially mm -hmm. over time and in different places and different branches of Christianity. Yeah. It was just like, holy cow, I knew none of this stuff. Mm. That's unbelievable. Yeah, that's fascinating. And there was, there was an initial kind of resentment with that of like, why didn't mm. I ever know any of this stuff? Uh, I'm not really there anymore. I mean, I, under, I think I understand how this, most people are just scared, man. Mm. All, all this kind of ideological tribalism is just scared. People are scared, yeah. I think. And, and you can, I think when you allow yourself to have compassion with that, you know, like there's this great Graham Green line where he says like, hate is a lack of imagination. I think mm. fear is too. Perfect love casts out fear. Mm. And so, um, I say all that to say, like, I've, I've really gone through the gamut of reassessing ways of understanding all these different doctrines and studying them. But like the broad, the like meat, mm. boots on the ground aspects of Christianity with like true religion is this, like, give a little one a cup of water, clothe the hungry, love your enemies, sacrifice. I mean, and it makes no sense on an evolutionary sense, but it, unless you want to abstract it to like group group evolution but like that makes no sense for me mm. really on a naturalist perspective it's the idea of self-sacrifice is nonsense yeah like when you said earlier you, you were kind of asking me what my fear what my anxiety is around um you know the theological conversation unfolding and specifically how that gets tied to notions of metamodernism, which, you know, I have a lot of ideas about and, and care about as a, as a paradigm. Um, I think it comes back to this, which is that like, I, I, hmm, I'll try maybe a couple of different takes on this, but I, it all comes down to this sort of issue of like, I think there's a form of very, a very robust Christianity that's possible that, um, that can confront, like the upending of its historical claims and still uh, <laughs> to use your language, not care. It doesn't matter because those things you were just saying, self-sacrifice, love, you know, uh, feeding the poor, all that exists, continues, whether or not something happened 2000 years ago in, in a part of the world or not. Um, and part of what I, part of that anxiety is fear for people. It's like a, a anxiety that I have for people because because of my own experience of having moved to explore a lot of the history stuff it's sort of like oh as you say like that's troubling <laughs> right like what if that's true what if that's true what if that's true oh gosh those are really troubling disorienting world upending possibilities if the history is such an important part of of your faith um 
the kind of metamodern Christianity I'm envisioning is one in which someone could hold the notion that historically speaking, Jesus was very different and other than how he's depicted in the gospels and how they relate to the uh, universal cosmic Christ. And that doesn't matter <laughs> that it's like, yeah, okay, that's, that's a historical substratum from which this incredible rich set of truths emerged, but that's not the peg on which it all hangs, right? Because once you hang your hat on that peg or whatever article of clothing you want to use for the metaphor, and then that peg comes tumbling down, that that's really troubling. That's that's really disconcerting and can and can hurl people into atheism and nihilism and and do a real number on their sense of meaning and purpose in the world and their and their well-being. And so um so that's a lot of what the meaning crisis, you know, kind of speaks to me in, in terms of because I, I feel that very Palpably. And so, yeah, well, that's kind of my concern. And that's kind of why I keep bringing in the history bit. Cause it's like, well, can we move, can we move through that one and get kind of to the other side of that? Sometime? I guess where I would, my response to that would be and where I would try to encourage people. And I know some people are incapable of this. So like, whatever. Um, but, but it's kind of the idea. It's like an Eckhart Tolle idea of like the eternal now almost mm -hmm. is that anxiety is future projecting mm. and you know, shame, regret is like looking at this backwards moment. Mm -hmm. But there's this really great podcast by um I'm trying to think of the name of it, but it's a Rob Rob Bell podcast on the Robcast. I can't remember. He's had a few. I don't listen to him all the time, but he has some I reference constantly, and this is one of them. But it's the idea that <laughs> I think I I really think this is metaphysically true. It's hard because we, we're constantly projecting with our mind with this mm -hmm. propositional narratival stuff. Mm -hmm. What exists is now. Mm. It really is the eternal now, mm -hmm. like right now. And not even any any time you're thinking <laughs> of the past or the mm -hmm. future, you're projecting. What exists is now. What exists is now. So like the backwards historical looking thing. It's mm. even that trying to hang the head the peg mm. on the historical Jesus Christ. This is something that I think a lot of fundamentalist leaning type Christians try to do. And it's not that I would deny that. It's just that it's, and it's not even that it's completely irrelevant. That's too strong. But like, th th this is what I think a lot of those Christians get wrong who are just waiting for the world to burn and Jesus to come save them. The whole mystery of Christ is Christ in me. What matters mm -hmm. is Christ in me. Mm -hmm. The book of James, receive with meekness the implanted word, which is able to save your souls. The implanted logos. Mm. That's a that's a Cohen, man. Receive. The kingdom, of, the kingdom of God is within you. Yes. Yes. Or in Judaism, they talk about the divine spark all the mm -hmm. time. You know, I mean, this is kind of antithetical to kind of original guilt, mm -hmm. Calvinist kind of theology, actually, right. which is yeah. why I strongly against that kind of stuff. I call it piece of shit theology. <laughs> Um, and that's a double entendre because it says you're a piece of shit mm. and that theology is shit. Um, but I don't know, I guess increasingly as I've aged and debatably, I think matured in my faith to whatever degree that I have, like that's where I'm trying to yeah. be. And, and, how the, and the historical stuff yeah. is... How does that play in, in the TLC? I mean, especially, I think, isn't PVK a Calvinist pastor? I mean, so. He is. Yeah. <laughs> he is. We, right. we talk about this all the time. I mean, in yeah. Paul, if, if you had a private conversation with Paul or just asked him outright, he's like, Luke has given me crap about my Calvinism forever. Because PVK will constantly do that. He'll say, like, I'm a Calvinist, blah, 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 blah. And then whatever he says after that, he's not describing Calvinism. He's just mm. describing faith. <laughs> Well, he's just describing broad faith in God. I will say, I love that element of the of the TLC, which is its ecumenicism. It's 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 basically everyone on the Christian faith. Well, obviously not everyone, but everyone yeah. in it, I should say, is on the Christian faith train in some way, despite where they're coming from, and they're finding that deep community that you're talking about. And there's a lot of room for disagreement and 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 theological openness. Yes. And there's yeah. atheists, you know, Sam, one of my best friends, one of my closest friends who I talk to all the time outside of it is Sam, who's a Unitarian. Uh, Hezi is probably, he's a Jew who lives in Israel, has no interest in becoming a self-identifying Christian. Like, I love that dude. I'm going to hang out with him in the real, <laughs> our families are going to hang out sometime. I have no desire to convert him. Like, these are my videos that I've done on 
proselytizing and should mm. people be proselytizing? Mm. I don't think so. I don't think, I think it's a miss. Again, you're, you're moving away from the, yeah. the center. Like yeah. Sherry talks about this with Doug, Douglas Harding. You're, you're playing a game you're not meant to be playing. You're trying yeah. to be God. I think that's actually fruit from eating of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. You're trying to make judgments that was never your job. You're not even supposed to judge yourself. Again, St. Paul says that. I mm. judge no one. Jesus yeah. says, I didn't come to judge the world. The world's condemned already. I came to save it. Jesus mm. didn't even judge. I just, I don't, to, to your, I think a lot of what you're getting at in modern modernity and the stuff that you talk about is a fight against what I would call ideological, religious, Christian fundamentalism. Mm. And I am completely with you. Those, I think those people should stop doing that. Yeah, I just want to see people flourishing and living their best lives and us living uh, in a sustainable way in relationship to each other and the world and the future and the past, however much their projections. And um, that's really what it's about. And um, and to whatever degree, I think, you know, we're all able to hopefully draw on our experience and in our suffering to try to transform and transfigure that into something that can be helpful for people. Uh, I mean, that's really the basis, I think, of any kind of um, speaking from authorities, you know, if you have a your own experience where you're like, oh, I yeah. went down that path. It didn't turn out too well for me. Let me save you some of the trouble. That can be helpful. And of course, that also uh, doesn't need, that's not going to land for a lot of people too. Right. And and for some people, that is the path that they need to walk too. So like, exactly. and, and that path works for them too. So there's um, there's all angles of that going on. But, um, but uh, sometimes figuring out the wrong path is the only way people figure it out is going down it sure. too. Yeah. You know? Um. Well, acknowledging the time, we should probably wrap this up. But I, I, I thought this was really wonderful. I really enjoyed it. Uh, is there anything you'd want to throw in to the to the mix at this point? I mean, we could we could jam on a for a few more minutes on something if there wasn't uh, something we didn't get to or something. Um, I don't know. I guess it'll it'll be interesting to see how your. I mean, I'm not familiar with your crowd and your followers and the people that watch your thing. So it'll be interesting to see how they react. Because, I mean, I know how I'm generally portrayed in the in TLC. <laughs> uh, I have, have people who appreciate me. And then I have people who know me personally. And I think we have good relationships. But there are definitely people that I rub the wrong way. Because they're basically like, you're saying nothing. You're saying, mm -hmm. you're saying both things and nothing simultaneously. And I kind of am. Because I'm saying like the... I believe the history and I do think the history matters in a sense, but not ultimately. There's just, there are things, I think largely those kinds of things are distraction. That's what mm -hmm. I'm trying to get at. And so yeah. even though I, and I think believing that, so this is what I would end with, I guess, if I, if I'm going to say something, then you can close it out however you want. One of my favorite people, the, I mean, he's basically a saint to me is George McDonald. And that's one of the things that I'm, if I, if I could point to a, to an intellect or to a thinker or a writer, he's probably one of the best. And he has a lot of sermons, but he also has fairy stories and nonfiction things. And mm. it's been one of the most transformative things that I've ever read was his book, Lilith. Mm. And he influenced like all the inklings. C.S. Mm. Lewis said like, ev like everything I've done is a weak homage to him, essentially, mm. you know, Tolkien, Chesterton, all these guys. And so I've read him a fair amount. Everything I ever see that he writes, I love. And he has this line in Lilith that I almost have memorized. And he says, he says essentially this, and this is like the core of a lot of what I think is, um, the fact is, uh, no man understands anything. He only thinks he understands things because they're familiar to him and he has unavoidable relations to them. Mm. Um, so like people conflate familiarity and understanding. Mm. You know, like this table, you think you understand this table, but start deconstructing that with what you know about science. You don't understand what this table is at all. Mm -hmm. You just are familiar with it. Mm. And he says, <clears throat> and he says, when the fact is no man understands anything, when he understands that, that is his first tottering step, not towards understanding, but toward the capacity of one day understanding. Mm. And, and I mean, that's, that's in line with a lot of great thinkers throughout history, sure. learned ignorance. Socrates. Uh, you know, yeah. Yeah you know, the, the ch mind of the child, child. And, um, I think that really is, that's the place that you can get where you actually have humility that will allow for transformation, mm. even like the right brain being the master maybe. And, and I think what I love most about TLC and a conversation like this and why I'm so opposed to 
ideological fundamentalism of any stripe, whether mm -hmm. it's religious or political or anything, mm -hmm. is that you're not you're not allowed to have a dissenting opinion or mm -hmm. to have an idea that's different than the than the controlling narrative or the norm or whatever. And all that ever is going to produce is yes men or groupthink at mm -hmm. best. Yeah. And it's not the way forward. Yeah. Agreed. Um, and yeah, this was great. Uh, I, 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 uh, I appreciate you taking the time and I appreciate us being able to dig into some of those, you know, these, these thorny issues and, and very important issues too. I mean, this is like, this is the most important stuff for, for people. And, um, so that's, that's what I wanted to do. And I feel like we, we really, um, did that, uh, with this. So, uh, Mission like George Bush. <laughs> well, Luke Thompson, Thank you very much. By the way, love the mustache look. I know you uh you you've mm -hmm. gotten um you know comments on on the excellent uh, mm -hmm. uh mustache look. So the the profile pic that I have of you will be with mustache despite you being sans mustache, but just want to say yeah. both of them are very nice, but the mustache you pull that off very very well actually. I'm, I'm a bit jealous. Sir. Um but uh yeah, uh, appreciate it and uh and uh godspeed, my friend. This was really enjoyable. Thank you very much.